Libya boasts a rich cultural heritage from Paleolithic rock paintings through Greek and Roman ruins and ancient desert oases. These historic treasures, including six UNESCO World Heritage Sites, have suffered years of neglect and most recently undergone the perils of conflict. Karl von Habsburg, President of the Blue Shield Committee in Austria, and Dr. Joris Kieler, teacher at the University of Amsterdam and chairman of the International Military Cultural Resources Workgroup, have a common goal in the protection of natural and cultural heritage. They realise the need to implement protection planning before a conflict unfolds, instead of after, when irreparable damage has already been done. We both know the importance to be fast and in a place where there is a potential conflict or an actual conflict and you have to be there really fast to make an assessment and to see what you can do um, in immediate help. On a previous visit, they and other international specialists took it upon themselves to make a no-strike list of all the cultural heritage sites, an initiative that was the first of its kind. This, their second visit, has them travelling mainly in the east around Benghazi, assessing to what extent the conflict impacted on the cultural heritage of Libya. Special entry has been granted to sites that several months earlier had been welded shut for protection. Welding entrances shut is a practice which Karl and Joris advocate and teach in order to give the best protection to heritage in times of unrest. Although this may work for museums, protecting sites like Liptus Magna and Serene in wide open spaces is a lot more difficult. Thieves will steal anything. Thieves take the opportunities provided during riots and chaos, which arise out of the revolution, and they break in to steal ruins, artifacts and anything else. In perhaps the worst case of looting of the conflict, nearly 8,000 ancient gold, silver and bronze coins and a small number of artefacts were stolen from a Benghazi bank vault. Generally speaking, the scale of what has been stolen or looted is difficult to estimate, because in some areas extensive documentation, archiving and cataloguing was never carried out. Yet Libya seems to have avoided the kind of cultural looting and vandalism that occurred after the war in Iraq. Carl and Joris feel that they are providing a service that other heritage organisations do not currently fulfil. Because it's dangerous, it costs money, we don't know, but we are filling the, the gap and we hope that we will encourage them to take over part of our duties uh, and do, do the work that has to be done. And one of the things is to liaison with the military and that's why I'm the chair of this International Military Cultural Resources Working Group because we can bridge the gap between NGOs or IOs, civilian organizations and military organizations. Their military backgrounds have helped them to understand how best to talk to the armed forces and ensure that the preservation of cultural heritage is factored into the planning of military operations. I generally think that this sort of planning about cultural heritage protection will have to be part of any sort of military planning in the future, just by the nature of the conflicts that we are facing. And of course, in a conflict of ethnicities, the identity of the opponent is the most important target. And therefore, of course, the cultural heritage of the opponent is the most important target. And with this targeting of cultural heritage, it is important to implement it into the planning. And that's what we are trying to preach, to teach where we can, but also to live and act on it. Should this be the responsibility of the military? Joris and Karl feel it is. It's already in the international humanitarian law of the 1954 Hague Convention and Protocols that countries, including their military, should develop strategies for the protection of a country's heritage in times of conflict. The military can act to prevent damage, but also benefit by denying an enemy what could potentially be a way of funding a conflict. I will give you one example. For instance, when the opposing forces, or insurgents if you, if you want, uh, are uh, organizing their own uh, looting and um, excavations uh, as the Taliban for instance uh, have done and uh, the insurgents in Iraq they will sell the cultural objects they will smuggle it out of the country and um, with the profits that they gain the opposing forces will buy weapons and things like that so if you protect cultural property as a military you deny the enemy financial resources so it's a force multiplier clearly this is the nato channel reporting from libya